Okay, great. Uh, so welcome to this very lovely session, and I consider this to be actually one of my loveliest sessions because Trideep is a very, very dear friend. And yesterday, someone asked us, are you going to be in conversation with each other? And he replied very beautifully, saying, Rita and I are constantly in conversation. So some of this is going to be an ongoing conversation that uh, we've always been having. So Trideep, I'm, uh, do I need to introduce Trideep Suru to you? Let me just do it very, very briefly uh, and succinctly without saying that he taught at the Rubai Ambani Institute or that he was formerly with the Sabarwati Ashram. He is now professor at SEP. But most importantly, Tridip Surud is one of the most prominent Gandhian scholars in the world. And it's something of a privilege to be with him in conversation today. Uh, I'm going to pick up one small thread, which I didn't sort of get a chance to talk to him about yesterday when he was on a session on violence. And I'll sort of pick up that thread, and then we'll go on to some of the more recent things that Tridip has been involved in. Uh, so Tridip, yesterday, actually, when I was sort of listening to you talk about uh, the Gandhi and non-violence, I wanted to ask you, and I'm sure this is a question that you have been asked several times before, does Gandhi and non-violence stand as a, a discredited idea, in the sense, has it lost some of the legitimacy uh, it had? Related to that are two more things. One is that does, when violence becomes, uh, there's an instrumentalist definition of violence, and you see that as something that can be reducible to one or two particular acts, uh, as opposed to violence, which is a more kind of a uh, all-encompassing phenomenon, in, especially in the way that Gandhi talks about. And I'm trying to disentangle here uh, Gandhi and non-violence, for instance, from the concept of Amari in, in Jainism, which is to say, do not kill animals, do not kill birds, and so on. Is there something about our times that these two things, which is non-violence and violence, both have undergone a shift, a definitional shift, so that uh, while nonviolence loses some of its legitimacy, almost as a corollary or in tandem with that phenomenon, you also find violence being understood in a more kind of an instrumentalist fashion. So this is one thing I wanted to put before you, and related with this is actually another sort of episode from my, my own uh, work much longer, much longer. And I don't know whether you've seen this. I did an interview with someone called uh, Narendra Desai. Please don't think every Gujarati is called that, but unfortunately this man was. Uh, so someone called Narendra Desai was involved in the freedom struggle, and he was about a 14-year-old boy in the 1940s or something. And he gave me this interview where he talks about how uh, he used to be involved in making bombs and how you could go and sabotage a railway track or a Talati's office, but not see that as violence. But he was fairly convinced that he was part of the Gandhian movement. So I wanted to complicate this question even within if you like, the Gandhian movement of nonviolence to say whether it was indeed that uniform or uh, whether, and therefore it's, if you like, its legitimacy uh, seems to be sort of coming to an end because even in its moment, perhaps it did not trickle down to all the sections of the society. So if you could respond to this briefly, then we can go on to some of the letters that you've been involved in. Yeah, um. The answer to the second question is very simple, yes. Uh, the national movement, including the movement uh, which gave its allegiance to Gandhi, was a far more diverse, both in terms of, terms of its thought, but also in terms of its practice. Uh, certain acts of what we call sabotage and disruption, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Congress uh, workers uh, especially after 1939, uh, saw that as a legitimate means of disrupting uh, the empire and what the war effort was. Also, the with Gandhi's knowledge or uh, without? Um, 
It was largely without his knowledge. Uh, uh, also, in, in that instance, because he was in jail, uh, uh, the, the, the gotcha. movement takes place while he is in jail and is cut off. But even while he is around, uh, of course, it happens with his knowledge. Um, does he participate in acts that you would today call violent acts? And and um, the large debate that Tagore has with him uh, about the act of burning mm. in, uh, cloth. Uh, whether it is foreign made or otherwise, mm -hmm. does that constitute an act of violence? I see. Right? And, and so, so, I mean, right, right. so there are moments in Gandhi's life uh, or in his politics which today um, and even then mm -hmm. were contested as right, not right. purely non violent. Right. That's one. Right. Uh, two, um, was that the dominant strand? No. I think we've constructed that as the dominant strand. There are moments when nonviolent political action and social action became the norm, but large uh, action that happened uh, outside of those moments uh, did involve various kinds of action, which mm. included disruption, sabotage, mm. sometimes actually violence. Mm. And let's also not forget that violence also took place in Gandhi's name, the Chauri Chora. Right. right. Um, it, is, it is a group of people who go and uh, say Gandhi Baba Ki Jai uh, mm. and torch the mm. police station. So the, it's a very complicated relationship mm. that mm. there was. Mm. But the larger question that you asked uh, from yesterday about the legitimacy or lack thereof of nonviolence uh, of the Gandhian kind or even otherwise, I think um, nonviolence has become a very feeble presence mm. uh, in our. Uh, in our political life, in our cultural life, mm. uh, in our uh, everyday life. Uh, Nonviolence is again increasingly being seen as something that the weak do, mm. uh, something that people who uh, do not have either aspirations to or real uh, um, acquisition of power mm. in various forms. Mm. Mm. Part of the blame, of course, lies with the practitioners of nonviolence. Mm. Um, is there innovation in the methods of nonviolence that we mm. have? And the answer is no. Um, what is the nonviolent practice that we have innovated upon? I think one of the most moving um, practices that, you know, the two that one can think of, uh, one was of the hugging the trees, the chipko, mm. yeah. and the, the other, the yeah. chipko, right? Yeah. And the other, uh, which, which happened in our times recently of Jal Samadhi. Now, those are very mm. powerful innovations. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, mm -hmm. in terms of practice of nonviolence, mm. there has been very little mm. innovation either in terms of its practice or in terms of its thought. Mm. So, while we claim um, that the moral authority lies with nonviolence, the mm. space available for that mm. has been shrinking. Mm. So, it also seems to me that there is a conflation here, maybe mm. not consciously, between forms of protest mm. that stem from a non-violent approach mm. to a more sort of a conceptual understanding of what is non-violent, yes. right? Uh, yeah. that, that perhaps we are. But maybe we will come to that later. I want to sort of now begin by actually drawing from uh, the beginning of Ramchandra Guha's foreword mm. to uh, this new book, uh, Letters to Gandhi, and which is also the title of this session. Mm. So I'm looking at the first volume, but I'm given to understand that there are many more to come. Yes. So the let Letters to Gandhi, which, which we are sort of looking at from 1889 to 1900, and do note that this is entirely Gandhiji's period in South Africa, and which Trudeep and a couple of other people have sort of brought it out. And Guha sort of in his foreword to this book, and he says that how the uh, collected works of Gandhi does not give you a sense of, it gives you a sense of world from the point of view of Gandhi himself. In the sense you don't have letters that other people wrote to Gandhi, instead you have only Gandhiji's letters to different kind of constituencies. So Thridib, if we could pause for a moment and sort of dwell on this question of what does it mean to think about the world 
seeing Gandhi through these letters and how that is a different exercise. Uh, and talk to us a little about what are these letters and what kind of man emerges from those and who are, what is this range of kind of demographic constituencies of all kinds of people who are writing to Gandhi at this very important formative period in his history. So if you could sort of talk about that. Um, this entire project uh, came to be thought of uh, during my um, all too brief stay at the Sabarmati Ashram. And uh, are you uh, able to hear through uh, deep at yeah, the end? Yeah, um, yeah um, I, he yeah, mumbles yeah, a little. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, um, so this was something that we uh, conceptualized at, uh, uh, while I was at the ashram uh, for a very brief period. Uh, it came from this very deep unease with the architecture, editorial architecture of the collected works. Now, it has 97 volumes of Gandhi's writings and three volumes of indices and prefaces. Uh, but if you were to look at the collected works closely, there are 35,000 letters that Gandhi writes. And the assumption therefore would be that he res received either responses to them or there was some correspondence. Right. Uh, that's one. Second thing that arises is that a lot of what passes off as Gandhi's essays in the collected works and that we read are also responses, public responses to public poses. So, uh, or it could be a private communication that Gandhi thinks needs to be placed in the public domain. So you could write to him from Kohat and say, you know, the town has turned against itself hmm. and, and how do we respond? And then Gandhi then begins to think of a response which is specific hmm. to Kohat but not necessarily so. Hmm. So uh, the idea really was to create companion volumes to the collected works uh, um, by, by placing these letters that he had received which were important for him to preserve. and, and uh, and so the archives of the ashram uh, has about 8,500 of such letters. The others we are trying to, to collect uh, and that's how the project came to be conceived. What it would do, uh, if, if one were to read it more carefully, is that uh, one that our understanding of Gandhi himself opens up because uh, then you realize that there is a conversation taking place, uh, there's something happening to which he's responding. Uh, what appear as contradictions are not necessarily contradictions, but uh, responses to a very specific right, poser. Right. So this idea that Gandhi contradicts himself constantly during the day, mm -hmm. when you read the collected works, which is chronologically arranged, you get that sense sometimes, but we forget that it's actually a response to a specific query that right. uh, somebody has put. The particular volume that we're talking about uh, refers to letters from South Africa. And let's, uh, when he returned in 1915, uh, these are the letters that he brought back from South Africa and stayed at the ashram. Uh, 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 he, he carried all he those carried, physical letters. He carried those letters physically back to India, preserved them. Now what do they, what do they show? This is um, very early Gandhi trying to learn uh, how to negotiate one with the, the empire in London, how to negotiate with the rulers in South Africa, the four sets of rulers that he had to deal with, the people of Indian origin, uh, both who had gone as indentured labor, as also traders, mm -hmm. and the public discourse that he begins to form around it. So, they, you know, so the response, the letters that we have mm -hmm. are of all four kinds. Uh, they are of officials, so there is an official correspondence. There is also correspondence from his clients. Right. Uh, and, and that opens up a very nice and very large social history because constantly there are these references between two firms of lawyers um, who are writing to, to Gandhi and Gandhi is clearly responding to them about this man called Budriya. Now, Budriya is Badri and Badri we realize had gone as an indentured labor to South Africa and became, after the period of indenture, one of the wealthiest Indians in terms of owning property. And where was he from? Uh, he was from um, 
we know that he was from eastern Uttar Pradesh. Achha. That's it's Budri right. Ahir, uh, right. and 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 so so the you know it becomes a source material for mm. historians to do other kind right, of work. Right, right. Uh, because our understanding so far has been that the indentured labor really did not develop into traders. Very uh, interesting. Right? And, so and, this and is a Girmitya history. Th this is the Girmitya history which opens up in a right. very different right. kind of way. Also the, the kind of uh, letters which are Gandhi receives from the police officers, mm. now, particularly uh, the, the, the couple which played a very important role in saving uh, him from uh, a far more brutal assault uh, in Durban. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then you begin to realize as to how they see him, mm -hmm. their, his act. Right? And, and uh, very strangely, for the very first time, uh, Jane Alexander and her husband, uh, Commissioner Alexander, write to him that your act of forgiveness reminded us of our prophet. That's right, yeah. And this is uh, as early as uh, 1900. Mm. Uh, so you, you, you begin to, I think what's, what's happening is uh, it probably will in some ways decenter Gandhi, mm -hmm. but I think will give us a far more nuanced understanding of this person. Right, right. I also, I've also find it striking through the, when we are looking at those letters and the kinds of people who are writing to Gandhi, you have these Khojas, Memans, right? And I think this sort of a much more Jainapalu Bruhad, a mm. broader kind of definition of Gujarat, which is that Jaya Jaya Hoi Gujarat, Tya Sadakar Gujarat, which is uh, the, this sense of a Gujaratiness, which is so much broader, mm. right? And which is so much mm. more inclusive, uh, is sort of quite evident and plays out yes. in, this, in these also movements that these traders have made to these, to these places. Do you find, in this later period, this becoming sort of more restrictive in some sense, once he comes back to Ahmedabad and he's dealing with a certain class of people, do you feel Gandhi's own canvas of the kind of people he was dealing with, and I'm saying here specifically maybe related to Gujarat? Um, no. Um, um, one, I think the, the, the first part of, you know, what it does is that uh, we know now that the entire Asia Pacific rim is actually a story of indenture and migration for both trade and livelihood. And uh, Gandhi plays a very important role in the politicization of these communities, right. whether it is in Mauritius, whether it's in Fiji, yes. right? I mean, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and so you begin to get a sense of the kind of nascent political culture mm. uh, in the Asia Pacific Rim of the Indian community mm. uh, through these letters. Mm. That's one. Um, two, Later, Gandhi, I think you know, it becomes, um, you know, the letters are, are of an amazing order. Um, one letter which has not yet been printed there, but which would, is, be, is in the autobiography uh, that we've just published, uh, is from the first uh, Dalit family mm. which came to inhabit the ashram mm. and created a stir both within the ashram mm. and in the city of Ahmedabad. Mm. Um, and Dudabai wrote this very long letter as to why uh, he wanted to join the ashram, uh, but also gave you his life history, gave Gandhi his life history. So I think what it will do, um, uh, see, uh, the letters also become, smaller towns begin to write, mm. different communities begin to write, mm. women begin to write. Mm. Uh, in, the, in the South African period, uh, it's except for the European women, uh, mm. you do not have women writing to Gandhi. Mm. Mm. But the later letters, mm. large number of them, uh, be that of ashram women, mm. but also uh, uh, women who had begun to, to take space and make space for themselves in public realm, mm. uh, even in, in, in a village community or a mohalla community, mm. they begin to write to him with very specific poses. So it becomes, the canvas actually becomes wider. Right. The other thing that happens is he begins to receive, I mean, if you were to think in terms of an information network, it's the most amazing information network that he creates, which rivals that of the empire. Mm. Uh, you know, there is an every day, there's a police report going about Gandhi's activity. And we know we have access to those files now. 
So every day there would be a, an IB agent who has to, to write. Similarly, from people from across the country are writing to Gandhi or to his journals or to people in the principal ashramites, giving them pieces of information about the happenings, both in their lives, but also in the life of their community. Um, we know that, you know, for example, I was looking at the letters from Surat, uh, specifically around the riots in Surat. They report to him about the nature of injuries, the depth of the wound, they, the people actually go and get access to post-mortem reports, sometimes copy out the reports. So, you know, so what's happening is that through these letters that Gandhi mm. receives and responds to, mm. he began to create an information network which mm. was not available to Indian leadership. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and so his responses, the nimbleness with which he could respond to mm. a situation uh, mm. is also largely because of the, uh, mm. to put it crudely, the information networks that he created, fostered, mm. nurtured. And that's why it was important for him to respond to every query. So now that you're talking, I'm sort of thinking this fine interlocutor that he mm. is, where he's engaging and he's responding, where which tradition is that coming from, this act of listening? This act of listening so carefully, uh, is, it, is it coming from, and I, I don't want to create a binary here, but you know what I mean, is it coming from a certain sense of a democratic moment where we need to listen and respond in a way that we have pretty much stopped now? Or is it coming from some other tradition uh, where even if you are called a Mahatma, but you're still there, very much out there, available to sort of listen to people. See, I think, this, you know, um, we sometimes take Gandhi too seriously when he characterizes himself in one form or the other. We, what we forget is that he is a deeply political person from childhood. It is the Prime Minister's family, for God's sake, and something that has ruled Porbandar, Makhaner, Rajkot, it it's permeates the, the Rajasthani court. His father was appointed to the Rajasthani court. One of the first appointments was of Karamchand to that. So, you know, the idea that politics requires it to be available, accessible, open to, to different kinds of constituencies, needs, it's, it's, it's something that he has. But I think it's also a practice that he learns in London. Uh, because his early um, awareness about the kind of role that he might need to play or the aspirations that he has are formed as a student in London. And what is he looking at? He's looking at liberal politicians, mm. uh, both of Indian origin but not necessarily so. Mm. Uh, mm. The third is the training as a lawyer. And if you are a lawyer and if you have no capacity to either listen to things which are said, unsaid, Mm. Right? And, and make meaning of that, you don't go very, very far. But there are also sort of two sides to this, to yeah. this phenomenon, when you are sort of, uh, when you are engaged in this circuit of information sharing and mm. exchanging, one is also to sort of elicit information so that you know more. Yeah. And that would be a very politically astute thing to do. But one is also to engage so that you are available for audit. Absolutely. Right? His letters are also in some sense an index of the process of ed auditing yes. that Gandhi is kind it's, of open, it's, it's open to. to. I mean, it's, I think, it's open to, um, yeah. And then therefore I think um, um, it, it, it's interesting, for example, any time letters uh, or opposers were sent to him about his family, mm. uh, largely about um, Harilal, for example, mm. uh, or, or about the other sons, uh, even if this came as private communications, he responded to them publicly, mm. uh, subjecting mm. himself to the kind of scrutiny and, uh, scrutiny and audit that we thought uh, he felt necessary to do. Mm. Also, the, the way in which he would refer to his own self uh, in responding to a query, saying, your practice is thus, mm. but this is my practice and this is what I encounter in that practice. Mm. Uh, mm. So the practice of truth also requires that you allow yourself to be available to other people right. to either both glimpse your truth, but more importantly, to question it. Right, right. 
So I'm just going to shift the focus a little bit from this set of letters mm -hmm. to another set of letters. And this is, uh, we are looking at Roma Rola, and we are looking at Mira Ben's letters to Gandhi. So if you could sort of relate that to this mm -hmm. and... Uh, no, I think what, um, you know, um, there's been an attempt in the last 30, 40 years to look at Gandhi's correspondence with what are called key figures. And you know, we've actually not really done very much work on, on that. We have a compendium of volumes about Gandhi and Nehru. We have a compendium of volumes on uh, Roma Rola and, and, and Gandhi and Tagore and Gandhi, to which we added Mirabel. Uh, why did we feel the need to add uh, Mirabel Medline Slade? One that she, um, she was the first among the Westerners to come and inhabit the ashram. Uh, and the ashram, in some strange ways, in at least in Ahmedabad, was a very Gujarati institution, mm -hmm. um, um, both in its strengths and also in terms of its weaknesses, in terms of its not really opening itself out mm. to others mm. who be then began to, to okay. come and stay. Mm. So for even to understand the social history of the ashram, uh, Mira becomes a very important right, right. point of reference. As to how comfortable she was. She was or she was not. Uh, uh, the fact that she, she felt uh, alien in that place. Mm. Uh, the women uh, disliked her immensely mm. uh, because a no, large number of women who joined the ashram in the first instance came as wives and daughters, not necessarily mm. entirely through their own volition not wanting to give up the autonomy of the household. Mm. And here is this person who, mm. who takes a very autonomous stand. So it was a very uncomfortable existence there. But also the, the way she made journey through Rajasthan, mm. Bihar, mm. the Himalayan hills. And then you begin to understand the kind of constructive work that Gandhi is beginning to think. Mm. Yeah. Also, of course, their personal relationship, her deep attachment uh, to Gandhi, her need to be constantly in the presence of Gandhi, mm. and also the way in which she would come close and then move away. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it's a fascinating relationship. Mm. But more than just the, the, the private part of the relationship, I think it had very important lessons for us mm. uh, as possible historians of the ashram, uh, um, as, as a document which would give us mm. something about the constructive activities. Mm. Roma Rola, I think, is is central mm. uh, uh, because what Roma Rola does is that he writes three biographies, one of Gandhi, the other of Tagore, and one of Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Mm. He is, and he's not met any of them. Mm. But he, he meets C.F. Andrews, right? I yeah, think, yeah, right. Uh, but what, what happens is that Roma Rola positions India of a certain kind for Europe. As, as, as a land of moral authority, uh, mm. something that Europe probably had mm. and has lost. Mm. So that's, so Roma Rola became, became a very crucial figure uh, mm. for forms of Indian nationalism, mm. forms of Indian moral authority, mm. uh, and there his relationship to Gandhi mm. became very important. And then you see through the letters how Rola's own, um, understanding, but more importantly, his uh, evolution, um, 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 his examination of Europe changes. Mm. Uh, the greater and greater despondency that he has about the moral failings of Europe. Right, uh, right. Uh, that, so I think uh, to understand one, the position that Gandhi began to acquire around 1920, late 1920s, for the European intellectuals and politicians, mm. uh, um, outside of Britain, mm. uh, in the continent, Roma Rola becomes central. Yeah. I mean, maybe there'll be another occasion for us mm. to talk about this. Mm. I also found it very interesting, mm. those two volumes, which, which to me also involve a fair degree of translation mm. of the people themselves mm -hmm. who in proximity with Gandhi become something else. Mm -hmm. And what are the terms of change mm -hmm. that are being discussed here as mm. to how much should Meera Ben become from, you know, mm -hmm. Madeline Slade to Meera Ben. Mm. Uh, but maybe we will talk about that some other time. I want to now sort of shift your attention, uh, Trudeep, to the critical edition of the autobiography. So 
Penguin India has recently come out, and I'm, this, is, this will be available at the, at the author sign up outside, a huge tome, which is the critical edition of Gandhi's autobiography, which has always existed, but now it has uh, Thrudeep's extremely fine, meticulous annotation of all things that Gandhi could have said, would have said, required explanation or some response, and so on and so forth. So if you could talk about that a little bit, Sudeep, that'd be nice. See, I think um, autobiography is perhaps the most widely read text, uh, um, not only of Gandhi's uh, writings, but I think uh, our entry into Gandhi is quite often through the autobiography. Uh, entry into the act of writing about ourselves in India is also, it becomes a principal reference point. Uh, and it's not a simple text at all. Uh, there is a particular way in which Gandhi writes. It's written, we realize, every week. And it's published every week. It's almost, not almost, it's serialized. It's mm. not written as a book. Mm. It then becomes a book. It is intended to become a book, but these are weekly columns that he wrote in Gujarati, almost simulat simultaneously translated in English. So it, ha it has the quality of... So how did it work? He would be writing and Mahadev Bhai would be translating? Yes. And then they would go through the English translation yes. together. together? sometimes. Uh, sometimes other people like Meera Ben also would be on overlooking Mahadev's shoulder and... and, and Making, but she wouldn't know Gujarati, right? She wouldn't know Gujarati, but she would look at whether uh, this turn of phrase was elegant enough or not, and, 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 and interesting things happened there. So one had to look at the autobiography as it was in Gujarati, the translations that happened. Also, it had um, two editions in Gandhi's lifetime, and there was a revised edition mm -hmm. printed, uh, which is the edition that we read in 19, this is the 1940 edition that all of us read, uh, is the 1940 edition. Mm -hmm. That's the edition which is also printed in the collected works of Gandhi. Mm -hmm. So there were two questions. What are the differences between the two editions? So mm -hmm. one had to fix the, the edition and say, these are the changes that have taken place. Um, Mahadev, uh, in the preface to the second edition, um, did not reveal the name of the person who had done the revisions, mm -hmm. and but said that, you know, apart from other things, uh, he's an eminent English scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, and people began to read the word eminent English scholar uh, to mean a person who's English. Hmm. So there were two suspects, or three, hmm. depending upon where you came from. Hmm. Uh, your first suspect was C.F. Andrews, hmm. Charlie, hmm. Uh, which would have meant, uh, which would have been very, very possible, hmm. uh, deep, deep friendship, um, very relevant. Hmm. So both lapsed priests in hmm. some form, hmm. and Mira, who aspired to monkhood. Mm. And so therefore, people who read the autobiography began to say, in commentarial tradition, that the autobiography in English is far more guilt-ridden guilt -ridden. Mm. than it is in Gujarati. I see. Right? So the word, for example, my double shame. Not once, I mean, not enough to be shamed once, but mm. shamed twice. Mm. That doesn't exist in Gujarati. Hmm. And what exists in Gujarati? Mari Sharam. Right. Sharam. 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 Hmm? My double shame. Hmm? Uh, right? Or my Himalayan blunder. Hmm. So even the titles change, right? hmm. which, which of course happens in the act of translation. But people began to read into this act say it is really a deep Christian sensibility which mm. is revised mm. the translation and therefore it reads in a particular way. Mm. Till you realize it was a good Tamil Brahmin, mm. V.S. Srinivas Shastri, who had, who run, had, who had uh, who'd run his pen through it. So, there is, so what, what the edi critical edition tries to do is to really look at the changes that are made between two editions. Uh, it also provides things which are added in the, in the translation. Mm. Uh, things which are deleted in the translation, are omitted in the translation. Can I possibly interrupt you yeah. for one sec before you move away from guilt mm. and shame business? Uh, Ashish Nandi says somewhere, 
I think, no, or is it Sudhir Kakar says that we are, Sudhir Kakar says that, that we are a society of shame rather than guilt, yeah. right? H how would you respond to that in this particular context? And then you can continue with yeah. what you were saying. Gandhi's, um, Gandhi's inner world, uh, in more ways than one, is deeply Christian. He is both deeply Christian. Uh, sorry, uh, Shantanu, you know it's always difficult for me. Uh, um, um, Gandhi's inner world, uh, in more ways than one, is deeply Christian. Uh, 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 the text that he's moved by and something that he refers to constantly, goes back uh, constantly for spiritual guidance, is the sermon. And, and we on, only wish to speak about the Bhagavad Gita as being that guide. Uh, let's also not forget that uh, the only religion that he made textual study of, mm. textual study, not through practice, mm -hmm. but textual study of, in a systematic way, it's is Christianity. Christianity. Uh, uh, he is also part of very interesting dissenting groups within Christianity, the Esoteric Christian Union, uh, which is the first feminist church of Anna Kingsford. Uh, right? And he actually became an agent uh, for their books. Uh, one of the letterheads that we have, it says, Agent for Esoteric Christian Union. Uh, right? so, uh, so yes, I mean, I think uh, Sudhir Kakar is right, but uh, we need to understand that Gandhi's references are, are other than the mm. kind of references that we think. Mm. Uh, his exemplars are far more, mm. uh, and, and um, Christ would definitely be one of the principal exemplars mm. for him. So, I think the idea of guilt is right. something which is very much there. The other thing which is uh, something that he should have mentioned, which he does not, is that this guilt also comes probably also from this overwhelming need that Gandhi has to take a pledge and remain true to it. Hmm. Gandhi's perception, self-perception, is about a person who takes a vrat, hmm. a pledge. Hmm. And Right? And, and, and then he would measure himself by his capacity to either remain true to that pledge, mm. both in letter, but more in terms of spirit. Mm. Uh, so the attendant shame is not shame, is guilt. Mm. The failure leads to a sense not only of shame, but of guilt, almost coming closer to a sense of having committed a sin. Mm. It's very fascinating because, and now I think I've got my facts right, so this, it is Ashish Nandi for what I'm about to say, mm. uh, not Sudhir Kakar. Mm. And Ashish Nandi says that this is what Gandhi means today, mm. that you have a room full of people mm. engaged in this raucous kind of a party, mm. you know, and the old grandfather walks in and there is suddenly a sense of quiet and guilt at having fun. And so I'm, I'm sort of now thinking, Pradeep, where does this guilt reside? And who's the one generating it? And where is it being produced? Well, uh, tell me about it. And I, I <laughs> lived for five years at the ashram. So uh, you can imagine what it did to me and what <laughs> I, uh, people only think of what I did to the ashram, which is uh, uh, what it did to, to you, know. Uh, you know, the demands that he makes on you are, Tremendous. Right. Um, these are demands at the level of the self, very deeply felt, uh, at the level of what is the right, uh, also at the level of the political, uh, in terms of your mm. uh, constant urges that you are subjected to, both in terms of your body and otherwise. So yes, he, 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 if, you, if you allow him, um, he takes possession of your soul. Uh, 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 mm. To great enrichment, mm. uh, but very troublesome. So, if I may sort of connect this, Trudeep, with one of your earlier, earlier, was that, were you able to hear him? Was, yeah. 
If I may connect this with one of your earlier translations of, yeah. I wish you'd suggested much earlier, now I feel bad. Yes. Yes. Do we do that right away? Why not? We don't have to have any precedents. So, one question and then. So, when you were translating Harilal's uh, book, I see in the preface where you talk about how this, when I engage with Gandhi during the day and I translate Harilal in the basement during the night, almost as if that was also an act of transgression, of listening to some other side that you weren't sort of quite uh, ready with? Is it possible for me to connect, to sort of see that in relation with a kind of a demand that you talked about on the self that, uh, or we can move on to something no, else. I, I, I will be able to respond to that. Um, I was asked, I mean, um, as part of my apprenticeship to Gandhi, I was asked to, to do this very massive biography of Gandhi done by Narayan Desai, which ran into four volumes, 2,400 pages. And I felt that if I, if I were to, uh, to do that, it would give me the kind of apprenticeship that is required uh, to, to understand Gandhi. Because what it does is it forces you to live with Gandhi from day to day. And when I began to do that, I realized that there was something that was bothering me about that life. And among, the, among a lot of things that bothered me about that life was the life of Harilal Gandhi. So almost as an act of rebellion mm. ab about uh, to Bapu, uh, and uh, I could not have been uh, more er errant and more dissenting than Harilal, mm. I began to translate the life of Harilal Gandhi uh, at night. So, during the day, there is light and there is Gandhi, and at night, there is darkness and there is Harilal. Uh, uh, and I think what saved me and, 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 uh, and what saved both the projects was this ability and the need, more than the ability, the need to tell both stories simultaneously. And if I, I feel that if I had not done one or the other, and not done them simultaneously, uh, something of my understanding, something of my own self-practices would have been diminished in the process. Uh, also, it took me a while to say, I am also translating, or I am telling the life of Harilal. I'm adding to that life uh, by, yeah. Uh, and then I realized that it was not, darkness was not necessary. Hiding in the basement was not necessary uh, um, um, because it was as much part of that light. Uh, yeah. uh, it was as much part of the life of Kasturba and Bapu uh, as the light life right. that I was writing and translating for four years. Right. Uh, so I think it was, um, it saved, I think, saved something of me. Yeah. So, uh, I have tons of other things, but I think this will be an ongoing conversation between me and Trudeep. I do see a lot of interest in the audience and questions. So how do we go about this? We have exactly uh, 17 minutes. I think we can take, let's say, about seven questions first. Let Trudeep respond, and then we will see. Uh, so shall we begin with you here? Yes. Uh, hi, Trudeep. So whenever I hear you, I get like, fascinated with the logistics of these letters. So very mundane question, like you said, 35,000 questions sounds almost like a bureaucracy of Buckingham Palace was matched by the bureaucracy of Sabarimdi Ashram by a single man. So like, how was he like, possibly humanly writing them? They must be coming in all languages. Was he knowing all the languages or they were translators? And uh, how was he copying? Was he carbon copy, Xerox, cyclostyle? So what is the logistics of all this, the uh, huge number of letters? Uh, I, would you like to take uh, several and then respond? Okay. Yeah? Yes, please. Thank you, sir. We'll go to another question. 
Uh, this is a lighthearted question, which you may choose to answer in a lighthearted vein, uh, but it relates to something you said earlier about Gandhi's, uh, and also the first question about Gandhi's tremendous ability to create networks, but at the same time, his very ambivalent attitude towards modern technology. And so in the course that I just taught, uh, Gandhi and his legacy, I posed the question to the students, if Gandhi were alive today, would he be using email and Twitter? And what do you think? Right. One, yes, please. One more. Hi, Tridip. I would like you to speak a little bit about Gandhiji's letters to Sarojini Naidu and to Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. And also, is there anything in the letters which reveals how Gandhi understood that he had to feminize the Indian national movement increase participation to actually make the movement succeed and make it a mass movement. Can Shall we I take this? OK, uh, go on, what? please. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to you. We'll yeah. come. Um, quickly, Shantanu, I think what's happening is um, everybody at the ashram aspires to be Gandhi's secretary right? um, at different levels of uh, seniority. Mahadev, of course, has full access, but lower down. Everybody. You know, there is, um, there is a system by which these letters are copied. So Gandhi writes a response, and it's immediately copied. Sometimes, if it's a response in Gujarati, Mahadev would immediately translate that into English. It's placed before Gandhi for approval, which would happen with his speeches as well. Um, there are other people who are translating the letters which come to them in languages that he does not know. For example, the Roma Rola correspondence is all in French. Right. Although Gandhi had elementary French, it was not good enough at, 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 at that kind of level of literacy. Uh, Tamil, of course, Gandhi knew. Bangla, there was, uh, uh, there was ease. Marathi, there was ease. Hindustani, there was ease. Urdu, Gandhi, no. But um, there's this very beautiful letter that he receives in Tibetan. Uh, and there's nobody at the ashram who can respond to that letter. And Gandhi's response is very beautiful. He says, dear friend, I have your letter, your letter in my hand. Although I cannot read it, it can only bring me good wishes. I reciprocate the same. Uh, right? Uh, so that, that's what's happening. Uh, Philip, I think, you know, um, Gandhi's attitude to technology uh, is a far more complex thing. But when it came to communication technology, let's understand Gandhi is among the pioneers. Um, in South Africa, from 1903, there is not a day that he does not own a printing press. Yeah, till 1948, he's, he is somebody who owns newspapers. So the entire print technology he is conversant with. Uh, communications technology, he's sending out wires all the time. Uh, you know, we have photographs of, uh, among the early people to subscribe to a telephone in Johannesburg was a man called M.K. Gandhi attorney, Barrett Law. Uh, so I think in terms of the communication technology, Gandhi uh, would have a different kind of placement. Uh, but if you're talking about technology as the measure of human worth, Gandhi would have different response. Right? So Gandhi's unease to technology comes so that it becomes the measure by which human civilizations are to be judged. So. Uh, um, so that. So um, there's a very beautiful biography of Gandhi as a lawyer that has come out, uh, done actually by a professor of law uh, called Charles De Salvo, uh, who worked through the South African archives and the archives in India, uh, partly the archives at Bombay High Court, but you know the Bombay High Court archives were not done uh, fully till the centenary celebrations took place. Uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, and it's called M. King Gandhi, the Man Before the Mahatma which goes into details about his life uh, as a practitioner of law in South Africa. Some amount of work in, in Bombay, but not very much. Um, um, but we know, for example, that he had, uh, he had chambers with uh, uh, Sayani, right? uh, uh, the, the, the second time that he came. Um, uh, these letters, the volume one has a large amount of legal correspondence. Uh, bills being raised, solicitors being paid, solicitors raising bills. So you get to see uh, the, the way in which the practice uh, of law was, uh, of the nature in which 
Uh, you also get a sense of the nature of litigation that he had, uh, the kind of uh, chamber practice that he did in terms of consultation, which is non-litigational work, both for commercial firms as also from what we now call civil right work. But the phase that we're looking at is largely commercial practice, uh, where he is uh, a lawyer both for both, and not only for Indian firms of Indian origin, but he is a successful commercial practitioner of law. Let's also not forget that the man that we're talking about is one of the wealthiest lawyers of South Africa. He, the entire South African movement, largely movement, was funded by the funds that he received as a lawyer. It's only after 1911 that he begins to both consciously and otherwise neglect the legal practice. Till that time, um, his next door neighbor is the Attorney General. Tells you something. Uh, you know, Bombay is intimidating, right? Uh, why do you think I didn't become a lawyer? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no I, I think, you know, I, I think he, he was struggling. He was struggling. Her question on Sarojini and I do. And, 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 and see, um, Sarojini uh, um, is among the only Indian women, uh, among the women of the Indian national movement who has both a deep affection bordering on reverence for MKG, but also somebody who is almost an equal, or sometimes a superior. Uh, superior both in terms of a social, not only in terms of a social ease, but a political understanding. Uh, uh, about the way she would actually make things possible for, for, for middle-aged Gandhi in 1915 to So she is sometimes, in the initial phase, she is the pathfinder. So the relationship, you know, with Sarojini is a far more interesting, complex, and, and when Sheila does the biography, we will know more about that. Uh, but uh, Rajkumari, is, uh, Rajkumari is almost a disciple, uh, almost a disciple. Uh, there is a part of her which uh, does not allow her to become a disciple because she is the Rajkumari. Uh, and, and there are things that you do and things that you don't do. But what you find, uh, apart from these two, I find the letters to Ashram women far more, far more interesting uh, because these are the women who are not as privileged as, as, as uh, the, the other two. They write to him in Gujarati or Hindustani and, and these are real issues. For example, what happens when we go to prison? Um, it's a con because the ashram is preparing itself constantly mm. for prison growing. Mm. Going, um, what kind of bodily examination we would be subjected to? Mm. Uh, what happens to our bodily functions? Uh, and and um, you know, Kastur was available for one kind of consultation as a very experienced prison goer, but I think Gandhi became very important. So I think the what you call the feminization of Indian politics. The role of um, Satyagrahi women, who were probably not necessarily, did not have the same allegiance to the Congress as the other two did, uh, is far more, far more important. Uh, also because they came to them with real problems like, I have a child that feeds at the breast. What do I, can I participate in the movement now? Uh, and, and, and Gandhi is then forced to think not only in terms of a personal solution, but institutional frameworks which allow for that mass participation. Because to enable one is, is easy, to create a mass participation or, or, or create institutional structures by which some of these things are addressed is difficult. So I think those are, are, are very, very uh, uh, interesting. <clears throat> uh, yes, please. Um, could you shed some light on uh, Gandhi's relationship with Jinnah? No, not with Sheila sitting in the front row. It's it's uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's a fraught relationship. Uh, 
I Fra- think fraud, fraud, not fraud, not not fraud, fraud. fraud. It's <laughs> this it's, is loudly. Um, 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 I think you know. Um, I think the trouble started when Gandhi asked Jinnah Bhai to speak in Gujarati. 1915 or something. Yeah, and it has to happen. All these things happen in Godhra for some reason. Uh, 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 so there's Godhra, the Gujarati Sabha, the political congress is meeting. Um, Jinnah Bhai is there. And uh, Gandhi says, converse in Gujarati. Now, I think what's... What Jina realizes, Jina Saab realizes, that this man is changing the very idiom of politics. Yeah? And that's when that relationship becomes fraught. Uh, I don't think there is animosity. I don't, I don't subscribe to this idea that they saw each other as, as rivals. Because I think by 1920, uh, the relationship had almost ceased to exist at a personal level. It's only then negotiated through other people, uh, uh, except when they begin to converse again much later, one-to-one -one, uh, in terms of the dialogues about a possible framework for free India uh, and the placement of, of the Muslim therein. Um, but to, to respond to it in two minutes, I think, but let me say, I think it began on a bad note with Gandhi asking him to speak in Gujarati. And of course, uh, she will tell you that it also began by um, um, Rati having um, you know, aesthetic problems with the way Gandhi did things. Uh, we just might be able to do one question if it is asked very, very uh, succinctly and crisply. Yes, please. Uh, in Rita Banerjee's book, there are excerpts that Gandhi sexually exploited young women. So that was kind of odious. So is that the truth? Which book? I'm sorry. Rita Banerjee's book on sex and power. Uh, it's defining history, shaping societies. Okay. Um, uh, we're talking about we're talking about what are called the experiments in Brahmacharya. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is not a new revelation because Gandhi wrote about it. Uh, uh, Gandhi wrote about it while it was happening. Uh, is it something that I can explain uh, right now? Uh, simply put what he, he felt, and you have to, to buy into the theory or it's exploitation. Right? I mean, there, are, there, is no, there, is no, uh, there is no sympathetic reading of this possible. His idea is, very simply, if I am free of lust, then I am closer to truth. And every time I doubt my ability to come closer to truth, it is a signal to me that I am filled with desire, not only for others' bodies, but desires of all kinds, including desire for violence. So what I need to do is to completely be desireless. And to establish it to yourself, you need to do what are called experiments. So these experiments happened in India, in full public view. Uh, it happened with the knowledge of all the ashram people. Not only the, all the ashram people, it also happened with the knowledge of large number of Indians because these experiments were written about, commented, criticized, um, uh, called akin to rape in his lifetime to his face uh, by not his critiques, by people who were closest to him in terms of his uh, ashram institutions. Uh, his argument always was that if I am free from desire, if I am free from violence, if I am free from greed, it would make us free from violence, from desire, greed. So the idea that you, it's, it's an amazing um, sense of the self which says, all evil permeates from me. And if 
I am free from that evil, the evil that we see around us will cease. So it's an attempt to free oneself of that evil, not only of the bodily desire, but the propensity to violence. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, these experiments did take place. Uh, do we have writings about it? Nothing, uh, nothing uh, substantially which is not salacious, uh, but that's all right. I mean, we are entitled to, 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 to do that. So this gives me exactly, uh, what, two seconds to wrap up this session. I'm really sorry. You will have to carry on your conversation with Trudeep outside, just as I will. Uh, so join me in thanking Trudeep for this wonderful session today.